Um, I want to say before I start, can you hear me, first of all? I want to say before I start that I am taking the liberty of being I'm taking the liberty of not being an art historian, I should warn you. Um, and so I am, number one, not talking solely, I'm, I'm not trying to give you a uh, sort of um, before you go trip to the Met show. Um, everybody should go. I hope a lot of people here have gone already and I am going to talk about some of the things in the show actually. Um, but. Um, I'm going to take the liberty of discussing Byzantine art without differentiating uh, between Middle Byzantine or Early Byzant and Early Byzantine, for instance. And I know there's there are a couple of art historians here, and I hope you won't be too shocked by that. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm really going to talk tonight. Um, I've entitled this talk Byzantine Modern because I wanted to talk about the art of the Byzantine Empire with regard to what most concerns us as painters and sculptors, and that is um, what's going to happen in the studio tomorrow. Can you hear me if I turn this way? Am I still talking to the mic? It's hard for me to tell. Okay, um, I guess I can run these. Okay. And you'll focus them, maybe? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so I, I'm really, I, I'm trying to talk to you as painters and sculptors, um, as a painter who looks at this stuff, and um, trying to talk about what I think the real question is, the question that always should be in front of our minds, which is how is this past usable? Um, and in suggesting some ways, I think pre-Renaissance art, and most specifically tonight, uh, the art of the Byzantine Empire, in a very broad, painting it with a rather broad brush, um, how these are usable now. I want to first invoke uh, another painter's lecture on the past, Mondrian. Uh, Mondrian is brilliant, and there is in front of you a Mondrian, obviously, on the right, and uh, Christ in, enthroned in glory from Ravenna on the left, which, as you know, is not in the show, but is a sort of poor image of Byzantine art, it seems to me. In uh, Mondrian's article, Plastic Art and Pure Plastic Art, published in Circle 60 years ago, the same year, about the same year he painted the painting on the screen, uh, he, he is often taken to be, I think, mistaken, uh, to be giving a lecture on the inutility of the past. Uh, I think people interpret that essay often as a call for a break with the past, and I think Instead, he's going to provide me with my first classic modern connection with Byzantine art. It's just one sentence or two in the essay, uh, but I want to quote it to you. Mondrian wrote in, in Plastic Art and Pure Plastic Art, to have emotion aroused by pure plastic expression, one must abstract from figuration and so become, quote, neutral, unquote. But with the exception of some artistic expressions, such as Byzantine art, there has not been the desire to employ neutral plastic means. I should warn you, in all honesty, that he goes on to put down Byzantine art in a footnote thereafter, um, which I assume was added later. But despite the fact that he qualifies his statement, he is naming Byzantine art here at the heart of this statement, this statement of um, this, this extreme statement of radical abstraction, uh, a major um, call for, that's regarded as an evangelical um, piece of writing about, of early modernism. He's obviously recognizing something of himself in the Byzantine and something in the Byzantine that is in him, it seems to me. And I, that's, the sort of thing that I want to talk about, and I want to talk about it not only in the art of purely, quote, purely abstract or purely non-objective artists, but also in uh, a little bit in the work, I want to show you the work also of some artists, uh, both earlier modernists and uh, some recent artists, I'm not going to show that many people, but um, some more recent people who are working um, 
with images that are um, would have been vain to Montreal since they are recognizable, but who are certainly uh, influ either influenced by abstraction or are uh, really abstractionists in a different vein from Mondrian. Um, okay, no, I'm getting, I'm sorry, I'm getting to get straight which side is which here. This doesn't go backwards on the right, but it does. Illogical here, man. Sorry, I'm trying to get forward here. <laughs> Top of this forward, that seems right. Okay. okay. Um, I think space has to come first in this discussion. And when I say space, I don't only mean pictorial space, I also mean liturgical space, real space, ritual space and even by extension, worldview. And I certainly don't think I'm going to define all those terms for you, but I want to suggest that they are all involved together uh, in a consideration of Byzantine space and a, and a modern space that may have something to do with Byzantine space. Although Byzantine space is, Byzantine art is classical in its aesthetic underpinnings. According to the Byzantine scholar Andre Grabar, all Byzantine aesthetic formulas, including things like foreshortening, um, derive from the aesthetics of the third century Neoplatonist Plotinus. The space of virtually all, despite this classicizing um, underpinning, despite the origins in Roman art, it's clear to me um, that the space in Byzantine art feels unclassical, feels strange. Um, and here we have the, the famous uh, strange slide of uh, the famous procession from Ravenna, of the Emperor Justinian, um, a procession which of course takes place not with people lined up behind one another, but people lined up across the plain. And Byzantines insistently flat, flat insistently imminent figures, um, as we know, must face us, the viewers. They must face us, the worshipers. And from this, um, and, and most importantly, I guess, um, as Gervais Matthew in his work on Byzantine aesthetics notes, um, there's the question of depth when you have a space like this. And he writes, depth was considered more important optically than width or height, but it was conceived as being in front of the mosaic or picture, not behind it. The picture space of Byzantine art was primarily that of the church or palace room in which it was placed, since art was considered a functional part of architecture. And um, uh, we're back to Mondrian in a sense here, um, thinking about the parallel again, since Mondrian argues that art is uh, all tending towards a unity, since all the plastic arts are tending towards a unity with architecture. And the imminent space, uh, not to mention other conventions of Mondrian's art, the right angle and so on, uh, the insistent reduction, all have to do with uh, a kind of grand unity like that. Byzantine art, um, not all of the works that we have are actually in an architectural framework, but there's a sense that they are in use in the church, they are um, addressing the worshippers, confronting the worshippers. This is a feat in which, although feet are foreshortened, um, in which they can overlap, uh, despite the fact that they can overlap, um, bodies become coexistent practically with the plane. Um, and there's a kind of um, dematerialization that happens. We may want to ask ourselves, since Byzantine art retains some illusionistic devices like foreshortening, what the role of perception is in this art, um, right, right at the outset. Seeing is not painting, but optical theories sometimes illuminate the approach an artist takes. They help us understand where he sees himself, metaphysically perhaps in relation to the form, as well as the viewer's position, literally, physically. And Euclid's optics are evoked um, when scholars talk about Byzantine art. The Byzantines, based on Euclid's optics, the Byzantines believed 
that an object was apprehended by visual rays that came from the eye and touched the object. The separateness of the rays meant that the object, though thought to be perceived entire, is in fact being perceived by a sort of wandering eye going in passages over its parts. And, um, sorry, I'll get straight which way to go here. Um, although the philosophical under underpinnings are completely different, um, I want to suggest that this notion of uh, many separate passes over um, the light just went off here. Is there? Um, okay. I guess. Okay. Um, I want to suggest that just as in analytic cubism, there is a desire to make these, or there is, uh, there are separate passes over the same object, so that um, the artist is, is working over and over into, uh, into a set of passages which then finally end up adding up um, into a sort of dematerialization of the object. Um, it's known as a fracturing of the object often, but in a sense it's, a, it's more a dematerialization of it since you have, you have uh, patches of it, um, you have patches of the sense of how light hits an object from a certain place, certain, uh, in a certain light, um, but the, these series of, of passages add up and become equivalent to the whole pictorial field, the whole rectangle. I'm not suggesting that analytic cubism uh, is Byzantine, um, but I would suggest that Mondrian, who, as we know, and I'm, I'm, of course, skipping a few pieces here of what happens in Mondrian, the uh, plus-minus things, the, the uh, ocean, uh, the Pier and Ocean series, um, Mondrian, in a sort of leap, um, goes from the many passes over, pa over the object, um, the, this sort of wandering um, vantage point of analytical cubism that ends in the, the whole rectangle. And he perceives, he begins to perceive the notion of the whole rectangle and he ends up, as we know, both with the um, intersections, the vertical and horizontals, which he, which he maintains, which he retains from analytic cubism, um, but with this tautly stretched rectangle, which has local um, local movements in terms of color, but in which the entire rectangle partakes of uh, a, a totality of effect in all its parts, separately in all its parts. And I, I don't want to be, uh, optics always make me nervous as a painter because I don't think optics are painting. And so I'm, I'm uh, I, I'm trying to run as quickly as I can away from uh, thinking about optics here too much. Um, but I think that um, we're, we may be thinking about a sort of prehistory underneath the absolutism both of Byzantine art and the absolutism of the flat, imminent space of 20th century abstraction, not only Mondrian, but I would argue other artists as well, whom I will show you, and by extension, not only abstract paintings or non-objective paintings, but <laughs> figurative paintings that come out of the same um, uh, concept of space, that there is some sort of um, relation to a, a way of thinking about um, seeing that lies underneath um, this, this leap. Uh, let me just leave that on for a moment. I think Mondrian and others recognized in the Byzantines fellow artists who envisioned a parallel universe to the perceived one, as he did. 
a world where the artist is the bridge. This is a phrase that Gervais Matthew in, in his book on Byzantine aesthetics uses. Uh, a bridge between mind and sense. Uh, a phrase he uses, which, which I was quite fond of, is and he says that there's a second world, in fact, that man is the second world where the two are united. Most absolute, stripped of the incidental, Montjean's forms are still most real and concrete. The two aspects united in the reduced forms in the utter actuality of the primaries he always used. The position of the viewer in relation to the work is unambiguous, in the Montreal that is, as it is in Byzantine art. So much of the tactility of Byzantine surfaces, which you will see are filigree, gilded, fretted, and all sorts of things, and so much of the tactility, I would say also, of what happens in 20th century art reiterates it's being reached out for by the touch of our eyes, um, to use the Byzantine notion. On the left you see Matisse um, of 1937, um, sometimes called Woman in Blue, and on the right, you see something from the show at the Met, uh, and in throne, a small, what's called a private icon. This is a, you know, a small thing, a thing you could hold in your hand, uh, an enthroned virgin from somewhere around the 10th to 11th centuries, and it's in ivory. I should point out, I, I, when I put these two together, I almost felt as if I were cheated because they seem so incredibly close to me. Um, and you should know that um, the ivory probably was poly, almost surely was in fact polychromed. Most of these ivories were apparently. Some of them also, I guess, had gold on them. But um, uh, in fact, if we saw it in its original state, apparently it would, it would be even more the Matisse. Um, I, I would also point out that the throne, that sort of scalloped throne, uh, which sits behind the Virgin on the right, if you haven't seen it yet in the show, is literally raised. I can't tell if you can tell that in the slide. It's, uh, it's raised in, in not very high relief, but it's quite apparent when you see it. Um, there are, where to start here? Um, I want to say that this light keeps going off. I'm sorry, I can't see if I'm going to be able to see my notes. Okay. Um, there is a, um, there are so many things here, it seems to me, that are so parallel between these two. Um, and Matisse, who, I, I'm beginning with Matisse not as an abstractionist, but as an artist whose work comes as close to abstraction within figuration, I think, as you can come, uh, and whose work has uh, as much decorative, as much feeling for the surface and feeling for the, um, the movement over the surface and the rhythm of the surface as anything Byzantine. Uh, think about the coexistence of the figure and the whole pictorial field here. Um, in both cases, the figure and by, by extension, uh, including the halo on the Virgin and her throne, including the halo of flowers that Matisse puts behind and above the head of uh, his woman on the left, um, if you include those, then the figures go from very top to very bottom of the figure of the, of the pictorial field. Um, this is something we're going to find over and over again. Um, as well as uh, the sort of central placing of the figure in order to achieve a kind of symmetry. And I'm, I'm aware that there are asymmetrical elements in, in the Matisse, especially up at the top. Um, but if you take out the top of the Matisse and look at the bottom of it from the waist down, or even from a little above the waist down, um, it's remarkably symmetrical. Um, but think about how the Matisse holds the space the same way the Virgin on the right does. The Matisse, uh, Matisse 
um, paints her dress so that it stands practically propelling her, ejecting her practically from the space. She is in front and embedded in at the same time, just as the Virgin is. Um, the Virgin has the child in front of her, but he is, as it were, embedded in her. If you look at the um, relation of her halo to her head, to the child's head, to her lap, to the um, throne behind her, um, you begin to get an interplay of pressures that go back and forth, but which keep coming forward, keep propelling forward um, with an insistent frontality, the frontality that is universal throughout Byzantine art. And um, Matisse's forms also insist on being frontal. He, he plants that dress, that crazy design on that dress so that um, she is uh, absolutely um, stapled into that that uh, chair she sits in, and she's she's tacked into you know she's bonded into into the plane. Um, uh, so that she's both in front and of it, and uh, all of the local pressures of color changes and changes of rhythm in design pattern. Um, which we find in both of these things, make them absolute sisters under the skin, it seems to me. It seems to me that, that um, we have here um, uh, an, absolute, an absolute collision, an absolute unity of intent. Um, I'm even amused that, that the um, uh, pictures on the wall behind the Matisse um, figure although they're not as symmetrical as the angels who look over the virgin and child, um, really serve sort of the same purpose of framing uh, in the Matisse somewhat less symmetrically, but uh, making a kind of frame for, uh, to, to hold in the symmetry even as the figure is enabled to be enlivened by movement on the top. So there is a symmetry and a dissymmetry within the symmetry. <laughs> in both of them. Many of you know the work of Leland Bell, who spoke here and taught here many, for many years um, and died an, a few years ago. Uh, this is his self-portrait of 1980 with drums on the right. And on the left, um, again from the Met show, a Russian, I think it's from Kiev, uh, 12th century mosaic of the Deacon Stephen. Uh, portraiture is perhaps um, uh, uh, one of the curious aspects of Byzantine art and um, I, I think people often are confused by the amazing specificity. Yes, we know that they still have it left from the Romans and yes, we know they learned it from the Romans, um, but it seems perhaps surprising to people who assume that an art that, that is so imminent, an art that is so absolute, at the same time is hybrid enough to include and in fact capitalize on, because it's an enormous idea in Byzantine art, um, capitalize on portraiture. And um, I, I, these two portraits I, I think are amusingly similar. Um, Lee, if you're listening somewhere, I think you would. I think you would buy this. Uh, I think Lee Bell would have bought this. Um, he frames himself again. There's a notion of framing the figure from head to toe, pressing it into the rectangle. Um, this is no mistake. Make no mistake. This is no accident. Uh, look at the right foot on Lee's uh, self-portrait, um, which points like a Byzantine foot. Um, he's got it. You know, he's got that. Uh, just that point making contact with the frame uh, and then the, that, that pressure um, instead of a halo, that funny cap that he puts on his head um, to, to get the sort of curvature that the halo provides where you feel the bowing of the plane uh, as it bends and, and sort of bows forward to body forth the portraiture um, pressed in by the frame. Um, 
that I think is some of the way Bell and his Byzantine brother um, work together or work parallel to each other formally. But I want to say something about psych the psychology of this kind of frontality. And in fact, I want not to say it, but I want Arnold Hauser to say it. Hauser, in, in um, his Social History of Art, in which he carries on a very uh, love-hate relationship with Byzantine art, writes this about portraiture. And I'm cheating a little bit because he's really writing about, uh, it seems to me, about the uh, mosaics of Ravenna but I think it works. And listen closely because there's, there's, it's sort of paradoxical. It is a paradox. He says, the rigid attitude of the figure induces a corresponding spiritual attitude in the beholder. On the other hand, by this approach, that means by this frontal rigid approach, the artist manifests his own reverence for the beholder whom he imagines supremely in the person of the emperor, his employer and patron. This deference is the inner meaning of frontality, even when, and in fact above all when, as a result of the simultaneous functioning of the two mechanisms, the personality portrayed is the ruler himself, when paradoxically the respectful attitude is assumed by the very person it is really intended to honor. The psychology of this self-objectivization is the same as when the king himself most strictly observes the etiquette which revolves around his own person. Here is uh, Leland Bell uh, painting himself with some attributes, uh, some of his painting attributes, some of his jazz attributes, um, as uh, the Deacon Stephen is uh, depicted here with his attributes. And this interplay of um, this frontal figure who uh, gazes at us um, pressured into the frame, popping out of it, and, and uh, uh, it certainly was Leland Bell, this is a real portrait of Lee Bell sort of springing from the frame, but it's a Byzantine notion too. Um, uh, that there's there's this pressure, and that's what makes those uh, simplifi those simplified folds of the drapery, those um, those pressures in the drapery, which are meant to describe uh, the form underneath. That's what makes those work when they work in Byzantine uh, figures. That's what makes those um, those radically um, rigidified and uh, uh, carved in curves work in in um, the two legs that Bell paints there, sort of um, bowing out away from each other, and the hands that sort of spring away from each other. But the psychology of the thing, I think Hauser gets at the notion that you're contemplating the the king has uh, participates in his own etiquette. The painter paints himself. Here, not painting, but contemplating himself, contemplating you, contemplating him, um, challenging you, and so on. And so there's there's a uh, there's a Chinese box sort of continuum of uh, of perceptions there, layers which add up to psychology, um, even in uh, a a world that seems quite absolute and in which there is no relationship. There's, uh, there's, there's portraiture, but there's not, um, uh, the expression is intent, the expression is avid, um, uh, the expression may be spiritual in one case and um, avid and searching in terms of looking in the other case, um, but they mean what they mean, I think, in similar ways, in parallel ways. They, they manage to mean what they mean in parallel ways, even though they have perhaps uh, separate meanings. And here is, by the way, the um, uh, in uh, sort of uh, underlining a little bit what Hauser says, here is the crown of um, King Constantine Monomachos, Monomachos um, who is depicted on his own crown. 
Um, so again, there's, uh, you, you can think of another layer even of uh, people perceiving perhaps if you, if you want to, you know, riff on this uh, more um, and think again about a figure who is um, compressed and, and uh, whose psychology is being squeezed out of the, the formal pressures and um, out of the frontality and the meaning of the frontality, um, the doubling and tripling and echoing of the meaning as perhaps he wore his own image on his own head and couldn't look at his own image because others were looking at him and his image um, one on top of the other. Um, I don't know how far one can go with that, but um, it, it seems a, a multiplication of what um, Hauser talks about there. Um, and I actually want to put this back for a moment. Um, this is a painting of my own um, called Light Accompaniment. It's from a few years ago. Um, and uh, it's, it's an effort to use the same sort of pressure. Um, in fact, I'm referring more to the, uh, the, the image of Theodora and her retinue at Ravenna, perhaps. Um, but the curves of, of King Monomachos's crown um, and the reverse curves um, which press on my figure's head perhaps are, are not so completely different from each other. Again, the notion is of, of a figure who is um, compressed and uh, out of the pressure and out of the presence of an attempt at, at portraiture within a rhythm that, car that flows through the whole rectangle. Um, and I'm comparing this here to something that isn't even rectangular. And I think many of the things that we can draw on, um, many of the things that abstraction draws on and figuration that comes out of abstraction draw on, draws on um, are not, in fact, always rectangles. Um, that the pressure may be felt from an edge that's um, on an object that, is, that isn't even rectangular at times. Though certainly in my painting, um, I'm using the rectangle uh, and working the, uh, the curve into the rectangle as, as a, um, uh, an interior rhythm that becomes simultaneous with, coexistent with the rectangle. If we could focus that. Frontality in the body results in and implies both symmetry. And symmetry um, in Byzantine art is a complicated matter, I think. Um, there's a notion that it's not such a simple ideal since there is symmetry, which is death, a symmetry, which is a stasis. And then there's symmetry that has a kind of dynamic rhythm in it, that has a kind of dynamic life to it. Uh, living symmetry involves the figure who is capable of movement, of course. Um, uh, it could involve as well, it seems to me, a living plant. And uh, I, I think the, um, the most common uh, motif in Byzantine art, aside from uh, the figure, really, might be said to be a vegetal motif. Um, In, um, in these two works, on the left, uh, a painting called Half Past Three but by Chagall, painted in 1911 when he was a very young painter. Um, and this Virgin Oriens of the 12th century on the right, um, there is a notion, again, of what happens to the body um, when you're beginning from symmetry and you're beginning from the identity with the rectangle. And in these two cases, of course, the identity with the rectangle is defined differently. In the Virgin Orans, we have uh, a figure who is defined by her frame. She, um, she is, in fact, flung up against the frame as if she's being flung forward into a, a, a plate glass window or something, except she's actually being flung backwards. 
Um, and, but she's, she's plastered into that, uh, so to speak, into that rectangle. She's, she's synonymous with it. She has uh, become it and her drapery, in fact, um, in, instead of seeing the frame, the, the rectangular beveled frame as we move down, instead we see the, um, uh, the much enlivened uh, form, the, the different frame of the drapery, which is a, uh, uh, um, the frame come to life, as it were. And although it's fairly symmetrical, it has a kind of um, activity to it that the frame itself didn't have until it takes on her body. And, and assumes her body. Um, I'm reminded of uh, the Blaise Sankar poem uh, that um, Sonia Delaunay uh, illustrated on her, uh, on her dress, she wore a body. Uh, in the frame, uh, in this body she wears a frame, on this frame, she, on this frame uh, is worn a body. Um, the identity with the rectangle, the identity with the plane in the Chagall is of course, and a, a, a not head to toe from top to bottom of the frame, nor is he utterly frontal. But instead, he's identified with the fractured frame, the fractured rectangle, that is, of cubism, the fractured but put together again uh, plane of cubism, and uh, the prismatic plane of cubism that you can see through, that things can move through. And um, in both of these works, it seems to me, the pressure, again, and, and it seems to me so important in Byzantine art and so much a part of what is modern about modern art, both in abstraction and in a painting like this Chagall, um, the imminence of, of the painting, the sense that it is um, not at some measurable distance from us, but is, but is moving close to us, that we are in direct confrontation with it, that we can't measure a distance as we move through the frame. And the, the notion of making the figure identical with the frame denies the possibility that we're going to be able to move across the frame through fictional space to the figure. The figure is the frame. The figure is the rectangle. The figure, the figure is the pictorial space. And in, in, the, in both of these, it seems to me, that becomes a metaphor, a different metaphor from some of the others that we've just looked at. Um, in, in Bell's painting, it's a metaphor for the psychology of the portrait. Um, I think in, in, the, um, uh, in the Matisse and the Virgin uh, Enthroned that we saw, uh, it becomes a way of, uh, of, uh, of sort of um, presenting us a um, an icon, a, a a something that is beyond ordinary representation and which is ideal or on a on a, an ideal plane. Um, Matisse's woman, of course, is beyond um, beyond regular women. Um, beyond you know, she's that dress that stands up by itself is beyond a dress that simply sits down with the figure and so on. But there's a different kind of metaphor here. There's a different kind of possibility of a metaphor here. And it seems to me it's a metaphor for inspiration. The Virgin Orans is transfigured. She's transformed. She's, um, uh, you know, that, that gesture of hers flinging. You have the sense that her hands aren't just held up. They're flung up, um, partly because she's embedded so much into, um, into the frame. And, and uh, you move down her body. Um, through a series of displacements, if you hold up your finger and um, look at uh, look at the bottom part of her body and the um, the vertical axis that neatly splits her, um, by the time you get to the upper part of her body, it turns out that her drapery sharply detours to the left, and her uh, upper torso actually almost feels displaced over to the left. Look at her feet as well. Uh, the lower part of her body seems relatively quiet, but then look at her feet, which I think you can sort of see on this slide. Um, her, her right foot, which you see on the left, is way the heck over, way over, at the very edge of the pictorial field, very edge, while her other foot faces us um, rather quietly where you expect it to be. Um, 
The displacement in the Chagall is somewhat more obvious. I, I, it's a young man's painting. It's not bad, but um, but it's this is um, half past three. Is subtitled the poet, um, and the poet being inspired um, has his head completely displaced, um, reversed, in fact, and. Um, Surely that can happen again because of the identity with the with that plane. Because if this is a plane that things can move through, if this is a plane that is so flat and so translucent or even transparent, so paper thin that things can pass through other things, then um, reversals can happen and things can be displaced. Uh, look also at that sort of heart shape which forms the lower part of his um, sort of abdomen, which reminds me actually of what happens in the left-hand side of uh, the lower part of the Virgin's ribcage. Uh, or where her rib cage would be. So I, I think in both cases there's a sense that um, the conventions of frontality, of symmetry, of imminence have been used to explode um, into life and into a metaphor, a sort of complicated metaphor about inspiration um, uh, uh, two figures which really on the face of it seem uh, rather different. On the left, you see a pen, what's called a pendant icon uh, made of lapis lazuli of a virgin orans um, from the 12th century. This is a very small object, and you have to imagine it with uh, pearls and turquoise and little rosettes of filigree all the way around it. It's lost uh, most of its stuff, but you can see enough to see what would happen there if it were all there. This is one side of this thing. And that's gold filigree, um, the, the gold lines of the uh, vegetation and the, um, the uh, writing and the, the script and, and her halo. And on the right, um, you see Paul Clay's um, Pomona growing up, um, which is from the 30s. I don't remember the year. Um, I. I would, almost, I would almost be willing to argue that Clay might have known this thing, except I don't think he did. Uh, I don't think he did see this thing. But um, I, I think they are so remarkably close in a way. Um, a, the serendipitous coincidence of their color, um, I think, is not just my luck in finding two slides that work so well together. Um, I think there's something going on here that uh, we we can see as, as an important connection. Um, color here, the absoluteness of the color, abs the absoluteness of that blue, that, that blue that practically, um, that won't sit back, that keeps rising up. And there are so many things to say about blue. And the Byzantines said things about blue. They had very particular notions about particular colors. People have talked about this sort of thing in Kandinsky as well. Um, uh, there's no notion of that in Clay, but I think there is a use of the same, there is a notion in Clay that he's going to use the color the same way that the Byzantines do, um, which is to utterly saturate your eyes with something that is the, the whole, that composes the whole plane as one color and at the same time dissolves the plane because blue wants to recede, it wants to become the sky, and then it's so intense that it comes forward at the same time. And I think I should also be showing you whoops, this, um, which is one of the Mar uh, Matisse Moroccan paintings. Um, and I think there's, again, a remarkable resemblance here. Um, and I want to go back, however, to the um, to the Virgin uh, pendant. Um, in both cases here, we have a notion of, of a, 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 movable, a movable plane, a plane that is dematerialized. I mean, what is that plane of blue made of in the clay, or for that matter, in, in the uh, pendant icon? 
Um, there's, there's not a sense that it, it's pure ozone, right? That's what it is. It's pure ozone, whatever the heck that could be. Uh, we have a sense of it. We can take it in with our senses. But certainly, it, it doesn't have specific location in the sense that we can say, OK, we're moving six inches back. We're moving eight inches back. We're moving three feet back. It doesn't stay back. It doesn't stay exactly forward. Arguably, by the way, I think it's, it's a parallel to the way that the Byzantines sometimes use gold. And I know Byzantinists don't like people to say that gold implies an infinite space. But it's not chromatic. And here, I think there's a notion of using a chromatic color, using a color from the rainbow, but saturating it so much and filling the field so clearly with it, and then sprinkling over it something else that glitters and glints and won't stay exactly in place. Um, and Clay actually literally sprinkles his gold. Um, and let's just uh, look at Matisse for a moment, because in Matisse, um, there's a, a figure, of course, who is not totally planar. There's a figure who uh, has some volume. But the plane within which that figure is set um, refuses to stay, is, is singular enough from top to bottom that it doesn't quite uh, you know, place in terms of plane changes and so on. There isn't, there's a little bit, there's an implication of a plane change over in the left. You know. But the sense of a box space, which we might want, or a, um, even a shallow niche space, is sort of negated over on the left, for instance. And the, that rain of uh, red cir uh, sort of circles, um, which what are they? We don't know, just as the red circles that rain down on Pomona. What are they? We, we don't quite know. But they are, they are atmosphere. They are atmosphere that, in both cases, these forms move in and out of. The clay is a dematerialized form, which we see inside and out has the same substance. Uh, that's not true in the, in the Matisse. But because of his using that blue in something of the way that, oh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get the, the Orient's back. In something of the way that the blue is used here, uh, he, it brings him into some contact with, with clay. And I think all three of them are creating a world that is really rather the same. The elasticity of a plane, the torsion of a plane, even when the form is utterly frontal. Um, and we can look in that Byzantine icon at the uh, that sinuous line of filigree that moves up those plants. Um, and um, uh, think about the bending of that plane. Just as in the clay, we can feel the sort of raining of that red and gold, some of it her hair, some of it something else, um, and feel that she moves in and out of the substance of her, sort of coagulates from it in and out, um, she dematerializes, materializes again, dematerializes. Surely the Virgin Orans, the Virgin Orans too, is meant to be in and out of such dematerialization. Um, this is a sculpture by Barbara Goodstein on the left and uh, called Back to Back and a painting by me called Symmetry, a woman and two vases on the right. Um, her sculpture is from 1980. My painting is from, I think, 1993. Uh, I just wanted to think for a moment about the notion of, uh, in relation to both of those, all three of the things we've just looked at, those three saturated planes, in, in these two cases, we don't have saturated planes. But we have, in, in both cases, I think, a notion that the, the, um, the forms, uh, the forms can, uh, and let me talk about my painting for a moment, um, because there are two different, slightly different, uh, I need to come at them slightly differently. Um, in my painting, clearly, there's a notion of the identity of 
the figure and the vase and the rectangle. You move along the plane. These are seen as identical with the plane from top to bottom. Uh, and there's a notion of, of um, uh, the pressures of symmetry, the pressures of the plane having displaced symmetry. It's a sort of joke on symmetry, of course. Um, it's a joke um, that goes back to Augustine, um, who I think also is, is a pre, you know, is, is a sort of prehistory a little bit of, uh, in, in some ways, of some Byzantine thought. Uh, uh, Augustine says, um, that Phoenician pots, even though they're very ugly, when arranged symmetrically, become beautiful. Uh, and so this is a little joke on that notion, um, a play on that notion of um, symmetry and dissymmetry, and whether um, things that are uh, uh, that can be penetrated by the plane, um, uh, whether within their symmetry and in their, uh, the, tor the torquing and torsion of their planes, whether they actually resolve into the beauty of symmetry or whether uh, something else happens. In uh, Goodstein's sculpture, which is, uh, and of course, um, we're talking here about a constructivist idea, um, the notion of the continuity of the inside and the outside the matter that is inside and the matter that, it, and the, um, and what happens outside, that the contour is not an enclosure that encloses something that is different. There are not contents or volumes. Um, these are non-volumetric worlds, and I show the Goodstein sculpture in part to remind us that uh, this is a constructivist sculpture idea as well. The idea that um, uh, there's, there's an interpenetration from inside to outside, from outside to inside, and that um, the, the Byzantine notion of, although I, I don't think her sculpture is very Byzantine in certain ways, I, I can't go terribly far um, in insisting on this, but I want to just make the point that the, um, in, in the Byzantine work where the saturation of the field causes a kind of pressure so that the, the form expands beyond its own field. Um, we meet up then, we can meet up coming from that idea and coming from those Byzantine things with a constructivist idea which takes up the same notion that in fact the form does not hold within its, um, is not held or contained or volume containerized by its contours, but instead is in reaction to its own contours. Uh, here's the other side of this uh, Byzantine pendant icon, and um, uh, and a Sophie Tauber arc uh, with a glare on it on the left. Um, again, there's a notion here that um, there's a kind of saturation of color. The Byzantines talked about um, the light of uh, light being identified with gold, or gold being identified with light, and the darkness of matter, okay? And the opposition of the darkness of matter with the luminous um, uh, other sort of reality of gold. Uh, Sophie Tarabarup is not working with gold, but she is working with something that um, uh, certainly with the contrast of light and dark, um, the notion of matter uh, transformed into pure number or into pure rhythm. And uh, I really should show you uh, for one moment, no, I want to go back this way. Um, These are the two sides of this thing. Um, the uh, number of, if you look at the plants on either side of the figures, uh, there's a different number of uh, events, blossoms, uh, on the right-hand side from the left-hand side. And that has to do with the hierarchy of who gets more who gets more? Um, I think it's Christ on, on the right side and the Virgin Orients on the left. Um, so there's a notion in the Byzantines of measure 
that happens by pure number, and they were very fascinated by the notion of, two, uh, for instance, the number six, which divided by two makes three. Uh, if you add two, three, you and and one, uh, you get six. There's uh, oneness, or they were looking for a sort of they were playing what's called in, in uh, uh, Jewish thinking, gematria, uh, sort of things with numbers, where numbers become uh, significant bodying forth form. So here is Sophie Tauber um, using a black ground, which is um, matter in her painting. Matter not because it has volume, not because it is materialized as um, uh, uh, retreating from an, uh, a window picture plane, but matter because it feels palpable. Because, uh, well, uh, that's, that's let me not put it that way. Uh, because it has palpability. Because it is. Because it it has no atmospheric quality. It feels as if it does over on the left because there's a glare on it. But in fact, it doesn't when you see the painting. And black grounds, which are something that uh, you see in clay, you see in Kandinsky, you see in Sophie Tauber, you see in, in um, uh, Sonia Delaunay, are a device that uh, I think the 20th century abstractionist is understanding as a reversal of atmosphere, a reversal of the action of atmosphere. And in that sense, it seems quite Byzantine. It seems to jive with the notion of black as matter. It seems also to jive with the idea of gold, which is shimmering and reflective and, uh, and which they use so often as backgrounds um, or grounds. Uh, that it has a very absolute quality at the same time, that it seems utterly material and utterly dematerialized at the same time. Um, I just want to uh, show briefly um, Clay's Signs in Yellow from 1930, <coughs> because I want to suggest also that there is an idea here of the surface of a couple of kinds of rhythms happening within the same painting and happening simultaneously within the same shape, within stretched right through the rectangle from end to end, the linear rhythms taking place in some kind of counterpo counterpoint to the color rhythms. And all of this happening within the frontal plane. All of this happening stretched from end to end. And I think that's a, it's parallel to the way that the gold drawing and the, uh, the specificity of it and the, uh, the, the rhythm of it, both in number and in the sinuosity of the line, happen in relation to the blue saturation and then further in relation to the frame the, the uh, sort of events happening in the frame, which we can't really perceive very well on the icon, but the rhythm of the frame versus the rhythm of the line versus the absolute one of the color um, seems to me a parallel, a not, not an exact gloss, but a parallel to what's happening in the clay. Um, let me just go back to this for one moment. Um, that's a Joan Snyder, I don't know the date of it, I think it's relatively small on the, on the right, uh, and I show it, uh, it seems clearly to relate to the same sort of idea, the notion of a rhythm, a regular rhythm, and what could be more regular than the grid, in fact, uh, a grid which is drawn fairly regularly so that the intervals are fairly precise, um, not in, not exactly, not totally precise, but fairly precisely. They're meant to feel pretty much equal to each other, so that you're equidistant everywhere from every other point, every other node. Uh, but at the same time, there's a subtle action going on in the surface, which tells a different story of a different set of intervals that happens within the same frame at the same time, but uh, uh, adds up with the other rhythm as as a third totality, if you will. 
In Matisse's Vence Chapel uh, in the south of France, um, uh, and I, I just want to show these two very quickly, the, um, uh, uh, the Ave and, and the, road, the, cat, the Stations of the Cross. Um, it seems to me he makes a direct reference not only to Byzantine, but to all mosaic, in fact. Um, but perhaps particularly to Byzantine, since um, frontality becomes a very, very, very significant, piquant part of what happens here. Um, uh, Matisse chose to um, draw these forms, these, uh, both of these, this hieratic scene of the Ave and this set of narratives of uh, the Stations of the Cross, chose to draw them on an articulated and evenly, regularly articulated surface. There's no question in my mind um, he could have chosen another surface. The design of the chapel was um, uh, entirely his. Yet what he does is to take a surface which may remind us of Byzantine mosaic, um, of the rhythm of Byzantine mosaic. Um, certainly it's uh, it, the tesserae or not, you know, we have tiles rather than tesserae. There's a different, somewhat different scale to the thing. Um, but there are two things here that I think um, take off from something Byzantine and uh, go to the heart of, of something Byzantine. One is the iridescence of the surface, which is a flickering, dematerializing, reflective surface rather than an opaque surface. Um, and the second thing is uh, the moments of frontality um, the, and, and closed, complete form. Uh, in the Ave, virtually every form, the heads, the clouds, um, the figure of the mother, um, are closed frontal forms. Um, the mother almost becomes identical with, again, with the height, with the dimensions, of uh, the pictorial field, not quite, almost. Um, and the two heads are absolutely frontal. Um, in the, and, and so there's, there's a sense here, as Hauser says, of Byzantine that every action or, or representation becomes, comes to, to beco becomes a ceremony. And I think there's no question that there's a ceremonial aspect to that Ave, even with the word itself. Um, it is the ceremony of, of um, the, the speaking, the hailing with the word. Um, in the Stations of the Cross, I've always been struck by the fact that in the narrative, which is full of extreme perspectives, and uh, we've all seen uh, Matisse drawing uh, things after Rubens in preparation for this. There's all kinds of uh, deep, uh, uh, um, uh, well, not deep, but, but extreme diagonals. Uh, and then there's one moment, number six, Veronica's veil, that turns completely frontal, um, where there is uh, the, uh, the image of Christ's head, which turns and, and then links us with the ceremonial of the presentation of uh, the child by the mother. And I think it's a, um, his inserting that moment of frontality is, is a use of exactly what the meaning of frontality as, it, as we find it in Byzantine. Uh, I want to talk just very briefly about um, uh, a couple of things that are not figures. Um, the Byzantines uh, are phenomenal uh, sculptors and drawers of vegetal forms. And there is a, um, there's an important um, comparison that is always being made, it seems to me, between the geometry of number and shape um, and the untrammeled growth of uh, a plant, the life, the, the life force, the, the uh, urge of the plant to grow up and over. And uh, think of the, uh, those baskets of, of those plants that start up the, the wall at Ravenna and go all the way around the arch, which is a, a thing that happens, I, I believe, in, in more than one Byzantine church. Um, 
I, there's also an identification, this is from the show as well, this wonderful uh, figure of Adam, this single figure who confronts this single tree. And um, I, you go back and forth, tree man, tree man, tree man. And of course the man is placed on a, uh, a stump that has this diaper pattern that suggests uh, um, uh, you know, uh, some kind of uh, geometric, is it, you know, the, the geometrical rhythm of growth. Um, and, and the insistence of the precision, that marvelous carving of the tree. And um, I think that uh, this, is, this is a pastel of mine based on a Byzantine um, uh, ivory that I drew from in, in a similar show in Paris a few years ago. Um, the, the notion, I think, of oneness um, in the plant, the notion that it is, you feel the number of it, you feel the, um, the counting off of it, in fact, um, and that in that, and in the specific, there is both specificity in the plant, um, in the tree, uh, which is just as specific in, in that ivory uh, as the man himself, as that head of that man himself, as the body of the man himself. The tree becomes, you know, they confront each other. Um, and I think that um, this is a painting of mine um, which comes not directly from something Byzantine, but in which I'm trying to make uh, a connection and an identity between um, the growth of the plant and the, uh, the, the presence of the human consciousness, the human head. And I think there isn't, uh, in fact, a, uh, his head doesn't look like a plant in, in the Byzantine, nor does mine, I hope, um, in, in the Byzantine ivory. Um, but there's, there's a sense in which he grows out of the stump, um, he could be growing out of the tree, and of course we know the, we know the meaning of the tree there for him, and uh, he sits in a uh, conventionalized pose that in Byzantine means dejectedness. I mean, I don't think you need to be told that to see that he's sad. Um, This is a Philip Taffy painting on the right. Uh, I don't know the year, actually. I'm sorry to say, and I actually don't know the title, uh, for which I apologize. And a, um, uh, a Byzantine metalwork piece on the left. Um, and I wanted to, uh, again, make a connection between an artist who is, I think, working today, who's very interested um, in Byzantine decor decoration in decoration that occurs in a number of pre-Renaissance sorts of sources and uh, in which the uh, the separate rhythms are being compared to each other just as in Byzantine the insistent geometry allows the Byzantine artist to compare and I hope you can see some of what goes on in the uh, frame of this Byzantine um, uh, I guess it's a book cover, actually. I think it is. Um, uh, where within those uh, within those shapes uh, in the in the border, there are heads, there are um, vegetal forms, um, and they are not simplified into each other. But there's definitely a comparison between them, and there's a notion that levels of consciousness, levels of reality even, are being compared to each other. And that's an idea uh, I want to return to in a minute. Um, this is uh, a very red slide, sorry about that, of, of from Ravenna, this is not in the show of course, um, from Santa Polinari Nuovo of Christ raising Lazarus from the dead on the right. Um, Kandinsky's sweet mm, who knows the title of this? I can't remember it. Uh, a late Kandinsky on the left, um, whose title I don't remember. Um, sweet forms, it's not forms, but something like that. Um, I want to just note the notion of uh, the confrontation across the plane, the one and the two-ness of Byzantine art. We've just looked at Adam confronting the tree, and I would say the tree confronting Adam back, thinking back at Adam. 
Um, here is an action. We haven't seen much action. We've looked at emblematic things more than actions. But here is Christ working, an, working a miracle. Here is Christ um, represented as a, a one working a miracle on another. Um, across a plane. We all know that in Byzantine uh, narrative, there are a couple of kinds of conventions that defy naturalism. Uh, continuous narrative, which is sometimes used where uh, the same background will be used for three separate or two separate episodes. Or in this case, the notion that um, an action which surely takes place with uh, the figures confronting each other, literally looking at each other, how can Christ work this? Surely he works it, we know he works it, the miracle of raising Lazarus by uttering his name and, and saying, uh, telling him to rise. In uh, the Byzantine mosaic, he gestures. This is something that Giotto picks up. But um, as every student in our history will tell you, it's really amazing that he doesn't look at him, of course. And it's amazing that, um, of course, Lazarus, uh, to whom this amazing thing is happening, can only turn his head three, in three quarters view um, so that he still so that this whole thing is still being enacted for us. We know that the Byzantine Convention is not lack of desire to make a convincing narrative, but it's a, an idea their Kunstvoll and their, their will to form has to do with an idea of a narrative that is being enacted ritually for us, what, what Gumbrich, I think, very brilliantly once called ritual time and space, rather than a narrative time and space. When we cross that border that, go, that goes around that, uh, that frame that goes around there, we're not entering into the long ago and far away, we're, we're, conf we're being confronted back by Christ working the miracle for us. Um, but because the Byzantines feel this has to happen in a triangle out towards us, um, much of what happens in Byzantine art happens as tensions across a plane. Uh, and if that sounds like modernist space, I think indeed it, it, has, its, uh, it has its resolution in things like um, what happens in this Kandinsky where if this pen, and, and I know this is a tough painting for people um, because it doesn't read easily, but if you think about it in terms of uh, action and reaction across, across a plane, and he's, he's um, nicely divided it into two columns for you as well um, with episodes happening. There, there's so many episodes, so many little dramas happening here, in fact. Um, but they happen across the plane, in many directions across the plane. Perhaps, you know, a, a more um, um, multiplying more and more and more. Um, but the same reverberation, I think, is supposed to happen as happens in uh, the raising of, of Lazarus. Um, this is Jean Elion's um, uh, painting of, I think, 1962. Uh, has, uh, uh, the title has something to do with these being horns. Um, Elion starts as a constructivist coming out of Mondrian, ends up, as we all know, as a figurative painter. But um, this painting, it seems to me, is certainly um, uh, about the notion, it, it, it draws its um, strange um, queer magic from uh, its roots in drawing across the plane, confronting across the plane, and acting across the plane. And he then plays with doubling and, and uh, 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 the echo. I mean, you might even say since the action that happens in, uh, I mean, it's sort of felicitous because, of course, the action that's happening in the re resurrection of Lazarus is sound, the sound of Lazarus's um, uh, name being uttered across the space, and um, these the sound or the shape, the, the sound shape of this uh, this horn has been echoed across this plane and located in the plane as if it were um, locations in a Mondrian painting as well. I might add, uh, from up to down to uh, diagonally across um, to directly across the plane. 
And then finally, this is um, uh, something I think uh, an artist people don't think of in connection with constructivism or Byzantine art, but I do. Uh, this is Odilon Redon's uh, uh, Chariot of Apollo, um, a strange and wonderful painting in which, which takes place, as far as we know, uh, entirely in the dematerialized world of the clouds. Um, I know I've used the word dematerialized a lot, but um, surely um, when we look up at the, uh, the wonderful resurrection of Lazarus way up at the top of that church, uh, San Apollinare Nuovo, uh, where it doesn't look red, but it looks gold and purple, uh, the purple robe on Christ and the white uh, shroud on Lazarus gleaming down at us, um, what's happening is that we are having this thing wafted down at us. Um, I, I think that, that um, uh, Redon, who spent his childhood, according to him, lying on his back looking at the patterns in clouds, looks up at clouds here and draws a sort of golden string of those rains across, across the clouds from end to end almost um, uh, by, by implication of that rectangle across making an almost impossible tension in a plane, a plane that has no substance, that is by definition insubstantial, but because of the rearing of that horse versus the action of the figure in the lower right across that hypotenuse of the reins, um, because all of that happens, in a plane that seems to come out at us and down at us and into up into which, which we seem to look, um, it all happens in a way that, uh, again, I think echoes and reminds us of its relationship to uh, a world like the world of the Byzantines, an imminent world and a world that may have representation in it of things that we know from this world, but is in fact a parallel kind of universe a magical universe. Um, okay, um, I just want to, I, I'm just going to move very quickly through these. Um, here is the, um, a, uh, uh, a semi-dome from uh, Ravenna um, on the left with the cross inscribed in a field of stars and Clay's stricken city from 1936, I think, uh, which is in the Berggruen collection, I think. Um, uh, in a world where, um, in a world of parallel reality, if you will, I, I, I'm a little afraid of that phrase, but uh, in, in a world which is both real and beyond the real, if you will, um, symbols uh, obviously take on a uh, take on an importance that they don't have in a world that is. Um, addressing itself to the needs of, of naturalism. Um, scholars talk about the notion of hidden meanings in, um, in Byzantine, and the cross, of course, is far from, far from a, a, an obscure symbol. Um, it's a symbol, it's the universal symbol, we know it uh, totally. But uh, the field of stars is regarded as representing um, the souls of the faithful. Um, so that um, we, we know we're looking at the dome of heaven, but we're looking also at Christ amidst the faithful uh, in purely symbolic form, in, pure, in graphic form which seems um, those stars and that cross partake of the same graphic reality. Um, and they yield up their hidden meaning then as another layer because they can be read together. Just as the arrow in clay, and uh, we all know that there are many arrows in clay paintings, but here is an arrow um, that is directional, that is uh, an action. Um, obviously it represents a catastrophe, an enemy, um, and the, um, the uh, shapes, the lines of shapes that um, uh, come below it are also part of the same graphic reality. They're drawn in the same world. They're nothing but parallel lines or um, incised lines. An arrow is nothing but a line with a head on it. 
Um, so they exist at the same level of reality, so to speak, um, but yield up um, a metaphor about um, that is is more than simply um, uh, uh, a a sort of graphic logos or or a symbol. There, there is a notion in uh, Byzantine art of turning, um, turning certain poses and certain positions and certain relationships between figures or certain events into types. And um, I, I am going over time, so I won't attempt to explain uh, icons, but we know that icons are, are really magical, uh, have a magical sort of property. They are not simply representations, no matter how naturalistic uh, a head may be in an icon. Uh, and we know they are venerated. We know that they're actually worshipped. They're intercessor images. Um, but um, many images in Byzantine art uh, go from being verb to being noun, by which I mean that they, they, they take on names. This is called um, this particular one where the virgin holds the child and he gestures in blessing and holds a book. It's called the, the Virgin Hodegetria. Um, there's another <coughs> called um, the Virgin Kikotisa. No, blush. Uh, Vlacher Nietisa is the one on the, on the left. These are named in part after the places that they were, but um, uh, where the original image may be made. But then the original image becomes a prototype, as it were. And the same pose and the same relationship is echoed over and over again. And it becomes an abstraction. It becomes something that you can put the word the before and know that there are going to be changes rung on it. And God knows there are better icons and worse icons from the point of view of painting. But um, there becomes, there, there, there gets to be attached to these things an impersonality, a level of um, reality that goes beyond this is one example and enter into the emotions of this example. You're meant to enter into the emotions of the pose itself and all of the examples of that pose. And I want to suggest that, again, Leland Bell, um, who was known for doing series of paintings, um, and this is uh, his series Dusk, uh, two from a series Dusk, which he repeated over the years, um, where he would take um, in, in, in a way parallel to the Byzantines, again, he would take uh, familiar people, um, uh, it's like a, I guess generally you read these are the members of his family, uh, an event that is essentially the same each time, uh, and work it over again. Um, and I think the, the element in those paintings of their having become, uh, you know, in, in part, Perhaps it, it always inheres in series that they become something larger than the individual uh, versions. But I think there's also a notion of taking um, this specificity and um, pushing it to a level where um, there's something epic about it and uh, where the action um, in these freeze-like paintings becomes, the verb becomes a noun. One can almost, and to call it dusk instead of catching the butterfly, to call it uh, the Hodegetria instead of she who uh, does so and so. I think there's, there's a parallel there and an absoluteness to his forms and a, and a desire to get more and more absolute in the form. And the seriousness of it um, is parallel to, I think, what happens in those, um, in those Byzantine things. I'm going to end with this. Um, and I want to, uh, this is a Virgin Kikotisa. It's on the right. Um, and it's a, uh, it's a, no, I wanted the, could I have the clay back on the left? Okay. Um, no, I want the last slide on the left, please. Oh, I did that. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's what happens when you're used to having somebody run your slides for you. Okay. okay. 
Um, on, on the left is Paul Clay's Around the Fish. I want to read to you, uh, just quickly, um, some of the catalog copy about the, uh, the icon that you see on the right, which comes from Mount Sinai, which you can see has at the center the Virgin and the Child, and around it uh, many other figures. Um, first, they describe, they describe the figures, and then, um, enthroned as a child on his mother's lap, Christ appears enthroned above as the King of Heaven, revealing his dual nature as God and man. Surrounded by those who proclaim his glory, he is labeled King of Glory. John the theologian and Paul stand at the left, John the Baptist and Peter at the right. Beneath Paul are Aaron and Moses, Anne and Simeon, Ezekiel and David, and Balaam and Habakkuk. Beneath Peter are Jacob and his ladder, Zechariah and Elizabeth, Isaiah and Daniel, and Solomon and Gideon. Of their prophecies, some treat Christ, but most are devoted to Mary. It is she who dominates the bottom figures. At the foot of her throne is a line from Romanos the Melordes hymn on the Feast of Mary's Nativity. Um, Beneath this inscription stands Joseph, whose scroll bears his statement of faith in Mary's purity from the same hymn. He is flanked by Joachim and Anne, and by Adam and Eve. Mary, too, is shown in marital terms. Accompanied by her mother, Anne, and the proto-mother, Eve, she sits as a bride, unwed, between her husband, Joseph, below, and her divine spouse, above. Pensively, she turns her gaze to Simeon in the frame, as if to find the meaning of her maternity. She is met by his prophecy of the Passion. And then this commentator says, the image is striking for the learning and diversity of its biblical, poetic, and liturgical inscriptions. It links Old Testament vision to New Testament revelation and the incarnation to the second coming. It moves from child to mother and back again, from Mary's son to her husband to her father to her father in heaven who is her son, and from feast to feast of the Marian year. The viewer is drawn ever deeper into the endless layers of Marian meaning. Many scholars have taken on the challenge of explicating this image, but none has begun to exhaust the associative meanings that the image evokes. This is what icons are for. They open up the meaning of their subjects. They don't tie it down. Look at the clay on the left, around the fish, which is, of course, a pun. It's also about the fish. Um, clay is, I think, here actually making a 20th century gloss on an icon. He's making a 20th century icon in the context of an anti-still life, still life, a still life that takes place on a black ground instead of a table, a black night um, uh, with a dish that's also a lake or an ocean, um, with parsley that's also seagrass, exactly like seagrass that I've seen in an aquarium, um, a fish. Um, who is doubled by the fillet of himself uh, just below him, um, surrounded, surrounded by um, symbols and actualities um, of plants and other forms um, seen in their um, seen uh, embedded in the plane, uh, seen. Uh, in terms of becoming themselves, the moon coming into its fullness, um, the uh, bottom and the top of a vase uh, moving into each other or becoming each other, that is coming into being uh, as we move around. Um, what happens in this painting, which is painted in a way that people often don't understand, it has layers of uh, ways of painting. He's, he's um, being as graphic as possible, literally graphic as possible, uh, about the fish um, because he wants the graphic symbolism, the graphic realities that are nakedly graphic, like the arrow, like the exclamation point, like the cross, um, etc., um, to be able to uh, add up in the same way. As we move around it, and I think it's no accident that it's around it, that it's an array around it, this anti-still life, still life, where nothing really overlaps very much, but where things are instead arrayed so you can see them separately and so they can reverberate against each other. Much in the way, it seems to me, that this commentator has just explained to us that, that um, we uh, begin to un unpack layers of realities and um, uh, truths that the icon from Sinai unpacks for us. Um, Clay, I think, is uh, where I'll end with the notion that um, an artist like Clay, who 
looks back into the past, understanding tremendously um, what the conventions are that he's using and understands his own affinities, um, is able, in fact, to uh, make what is really, I think, probably the only true icon that's been made in several hundred years. Thank you.